Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, and welcome to our final panel discussion of the National Health Research Forum. We're so glad you're here to join us. Just a couple few notes. Um, if you missed any of our outstanding program over the last three days, please know you can come back and visit the forum site to be able to watch any of this outstanding programming, and it will be up for the next 30 days. And then I also would like to remind you that you can ask questions of our panelists by using the Q&A feature. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of Research America, who is going to be moderating this discussion. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, Ms. Mary Woolley. Mary? Thank you, Donna. Well, everyone, thank you for being with us. Good afternoon. After three days of straight talk on building a science strong nation, we're going to go on to talk about building a bold science strong nation. During this talk, conversation, in the past, over the past three days, we focused primarily on assuring faster medical and public health progress. But now, in this final session of our 2020 National Research Forum, we are going to take the conversation broader to science and technology, indeed STEM, writ large. Many of the themes are the same because science is not and should not be siloed. If science is functioning at less than full strength in any one arena, it compromises all of science and diminishes our ability as a nation to ensure health, prosperity, and security for all. The entire science ecosystem must thrive for us all to thrive. Following four presentations, we will open the conversation to your questions and suggestions. So be sure to enter those in the Q&A chat function. But first, a little history. Just a few months ago at the end of February, before the pandemic hit hard in the United States, many of us gathered at the National Academy of Sciences for a workshop sponsored by the academies, the Sloan Foundation and the Kavli Foundation entitled the Endless Frontier, the Next 75 Years of Science. The title of the program was a reference to the Vannevar Bush Report, requested by President Roosevelt of his science advisor, Dr. Bush, and ultimately delivered to President Truman in 1945. Bush's words then resonate today, quote, the rewards of scientific exploration, both for the nation and the individual, are great. Scientific progress is one essential key to our security as a nation, to our better health, to more jobs, a higher standard of living, and to our cultural progress." Unquote. The Vannevar Bush report set the architecture of and public commitment to science in this nation, driving decades of prosperity and world leadership. The group that convened in Washington in February of this year discussed how to recapture the spirit of the Bush report in the year 2020. But as we all know, 2020 then proceeded to totally upend our lives. We no longer had the leisure of time to work through a modernization, if you will, of the principles of the Bush report, which is why a group of us with sponsorship by the Kavli Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropies began meeting to discuss bold steps that might be taken by our nation's elected officials to meet the urgency of the moment. Here is a slide with the names of those who have been talking together over the past two months. Actually, it's more than one slide. We'll go on to the next one. We've made good progress and look forward now to your input. Our goal is to influence action towards substantially raising the priority the nation places on science and to do so without delay because, quite frankly, lives are at stake and so is our collective future. We're going to hear first from Suda Parikh, the CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, who will talk about framing the problem. Over to you, Suda. Thank you, Mary. Now the, the trick uh, this afternoon is I'm sharing my own screen. So that'll be the hardest part. Um, you can do it. Let me do that. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary, and, uh, and thank you everyone for joining us this last, uh, this last session. I should preface by saying that uh, everything I'm about to say is the collective wisdom of the committee that you just saw, and I apologize to them in advance for any mistranslations of, uh, of things that we've, uh, that we've agreed upon. Uh, so really, the, the, the starting point of this discussion is that the U.S. is faced with several profound challenges, and they're highlighted by things like uh, decreasing life expectancy, uh, the disruptions uh, to our environment, uh, the tapering levels of economic growth and, uh, and geopolitical rivalry, rivalry that, is, uh, uh, that has really taken root. And our committee is focused on raising the alarm about these issues uh, and, and making recommendations for bold action. And uh, to achieve prosperity, health, and security for all Americans, uh, we really believe that re that requires addressing uh, challenges uh, in these areas, uh, jobs and sustainable economic growth, public health and health care, environment and climate change, energy production, utilization and storage, uh, agriculture, food and water security, uh, and then national security. Uh, the, the key thing that we realized is that past is prologue. We've been here before. We've been here before. Uh, in the, um, uh, among our nation's many strengths, uh, really is our commitment to science. And this is reflected in the achievements that have been born of these crises, crises like uh, the aftermath of World War II, uh, the Sputnik era, and 9-11, uh, but also in the sustained leadership in economic growth that our country has achieved, uh, perhaps in a more quiet way, uh, based on science. And science is essential to delivering the solutions and enabling our aspirations. Science is the one um, uh, solution uh, vessel that doesn't require a zero-sum game. Uh, it actually goes beyond the zero-sum game so that if there is, a, if you solve the problem, you're not creating a problem for someone else. However, our investments have stagnated and their structures have frozen in place. Um, and too many Americans of talent and promise are on the sidelines. And that's really ref reflected in this data which is our, um, our historical research intensity. So that blue line there is, uh, is the percent of uh, G uh, our federal research as a share of GDP starting in 1953. And you see peaks and valleys there. The peak uh, is in the, in the Sputnik era in the early 60s of uh, somewhere between zero and 0 0.6 and 0.7%. That red dotted line is the average. And if you look at the last few years, uh, we've dropped below, uh, below that average. Uh, of research intensity by quite a bit. The other thing that's happened is that other nations have seen the, uh, the, the opportunities and progress that come from investments in research and development. And so when you look at this chart, which, uh, which shows other countries in relationship to, uh, to the United States uh, in terms of uh, uh, purchase, uh, purchasing power parity uh, and their investments in research, you see uh, other nations increasing their investment and catching up with uh, the United States. And really this means that you know, when we've done this in the past, when we've solved problems like this in the past, we've summoned our common resolve. We have mobilized to meet moments uh, with really generational commitment. Now, our past achievements really reflect the singular determination to use the assets of this country, the remarkable assets of this country, uh, it's diverse and creative and ambitious citizenry, uh, this amazingly optimistic culture in which we live, uh, our entrepreneurial and scrappy industry that, uh, that sometimes solves, uh, solves things in ways we wouldn't have just uh, thought of. Uh, and then at times, at times, a bold and visionary government. And uh, all of that put together to really advance science and to advance the moment. Uh, the genius of the country is really best displayed when we're all moving together, when we are, uh, to put it in words that, uh, that I think we all have started to really like and rally around, when we are all in. Uh, the opportunities in front of us are clear. Uh, better health for all, increased prosperity for all, and security for all. Uh, you note the rep repetition there of, uh, of, of for all, uh, because these challenges that we face, they are profound. Uh, perhaps even existential, uh, but uh, you know we have to we have to commit to these, and doing so 
uh, in committing uh, to, to solving these problems. We have to commit to the American people uh, and to infrastructure across the country. Uh, really ensuring our national success is gonna require addressing race, gender, and geographic inequalities, even within the scientific enterprise. Uh, the, failure, uh, the failure to widen science to all Americans was already unaffordable, tragic, and immoral before. Uh, but now with the, the demographic uh, gigant, uh, behemoths that are, that are on the rise, uh, it would be just downright stupid to squander the promise of our citizens to national prosperity. They should, we should make sure that everyone is contributing. So what happens if we don't commit? Um, there are two possible futures out there. Uh, one where America continues to lead and one where America is diminished. In the one where we lead, uh, research leads to innovation, which leads to prosperity for all. Uh, and that, uh, that leads again to, to support for uh, continued research and continued growth beyond again that zero sum game. Uh, the one where America is diminished uh, means that we're following. It means that we're unable to set global standards and norms. And it means that we are uh, unable, uh, perhaps, to, uh, to break beyond the zero-sum game. Uh, that is, uh, you know, of those two futures, I know the one that I, I would boldly want to choose. Uh, securing U.S. science is essential to address the challenges that we face. And more challenges are on the way. Uh, that's, that's the issue. You know, there's not there's not one moment, uh, there's not a Sputnik moment, and then we move on, we've solved that problem. Uh, as the world has progressed, as the world gets smaller uh, in this uh, wonderfully networked, as Steve Clemens put it, wonderfully networked world in which the walls are going up, more challenges are on the way. Uh, we, we must be all in if we're going to realize the remarkable promise of this country's greatness uh, and really address the daunting challenges uh, that, that lay ahead. Uh, but that's what we've done. We've overcome challenges like this before. Uh, and the committee, uh, a group of very optimistic people, is convinced that we'll do it again. Uh, and, uh, and, and through the work you're about to see, uh, make some bold recommendations on how to do so. Uh, and Mary, with that, I'll, I'll stop. Suda, thank you so much. Uh, you, you know, your reference to the all in um, aspect of what needs to come next you know, it has to be for everybody, engaging everybody. And that's really, I think, just a, a key, a pivotal, a critical element. Um, now we're going to hear from Keith Yamamoto, Vice Chancellor for Science, Policy, and Strategy, the University of California, San Francisco, about recommendations. Keith, over to you. Thank you, Mary. Let me see if I can accomplish the screen sharing trick. All right. Everybody see that? Great. Um, uh, so I'll just uh, uh, start with the same statement that Suda made, and that is that what um, I'm going to show you is, uh, is my best estimation of where we are in the committee in, in crafting a set of recommendations. Uh, that will move forward on the problem as Sudip has laid it out so uh, beautifully. Um, and so this, this section will talk about three recommendations that the committee uh, is, has, is converging on. Um, and uh, um, those are, those are not advancing. Let me see if I can do it this way. All right, this will work. Um, uh, so th three recommendations in these areas, looking at the investment itself, beginning to think about the magnitude of the investment in STEM that is going to be required to, to, um, to uh, take on uh, the, the problem as, as sort of has laid it out. Um, uh, how would the, that investment be structured? What would the goals be for spending uh, increased uh, resources in STEM, um, and how would the management or administration of those goals be structured? And then thirdly, uh, what are, where would the money go? <laughs> what is, would be the enabling mechanisms that would allow um, uh, uh, funding in STEM to be able to take on those challenges? So let me start with recommendation one, um, and, and it's bold. It is to double federal research and development um, investment to 1.4% of GDP. Um, 
on the graph, you see another version of some of the data that, that Sudeb showed, crafted to looking at overall federal research and development, not just the research side, um, as a share of GDP. And what you see is that um, uh, after Sputnik was launched in 1957, um, the, the American people in Congress were sort of shaken awake uh, by being uh, whipped by the Reds into orbit. Um, and, um, and you can see there was a steep increase in the federal expenditure for uh, scientific research and development that took place over the next several years. And by 1964, uh, we'd reached a peak of 1.9%, uh, moving up from 0.8% uh, over that six year period. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but since then, there has been a jagged, but pretty much steady decline uh, in that federal R&D uh, investment to the point it is today, which is a little bit less than 0.7%, a little bit below where the investment was um, in, the, uh, in the Sputnik era. Um, uh, and, and so this proposal to double federal R&D uh, actually includes uh, another important point, and that is that to increase the, re the R, the research component of R&D uh, from point, its present 0.4% um, that uh, Sudeb showed uh, to uh, 1%. Um, that would actually inc represent an increase of 60% of R&D going to R to 70% of R&D going to R and recognizes what, um, uh, what uh, Vannevar Bush uh, uh, really enunciated clearly, and that is that it's really the federal government, it's public funding that needs to support research that then the private sector can then uh, uh, utilize. So well-crafted federal research and development funds would motivate and enable um, increased private sector investment, uh, which, which is in the neighborhood of 80% on the development side. Um, and enable uh, uh, overall national research and development funding to go from its present 2.7% of GDP to 4%. High aspirations here, looking for a big increase in the way that, that uh, the federal government is supporting research and research and development. If it happened, well, what would the outcomes be? We would see advances in knowledge that enable applications and infrastructure and product to process development that will address critical societal challenges. Um, we would see high quality, high paying jobs that would be created across many employment sectors held by a diverse, resilient workforce empowered by education programs that are accessible to all. And the, the United States would maintain its primacy in STEM which would respond to the dramatic increases in STEM investments in China that Sudeb showed um, over, a, over a 25 year uh, period from 1991 to 2015, China's investment in R&D increased by 30 fold. So this is what we're up against. You could see the slope of that curve that Sudeb showed. So the conclusion then is that the increased investment is well justified. And then the question then that follows is really the lead into the second recommendation. And that is, how would we organize and focus on existential challenges? How would the federal government come together and pull together its various resources and agencies that focus on uh, scientific research and development technology um, to be able to take on um, a, a set of specific challenges? So here's recommendation number two, and that is to stand up a new uh, council a national STEM council, kind of a similar and analogous in its uh, um, uh, uh, influence and, uh, and power to the National Security Council that we're all very aware of. So a national STEM council that is focused on a set of existential challenges. This would be a new executive branch function focused on STEM-based approaches to specific societal challenges, the, ch the charge to this council would be to coordinate STEM activities across department and agency boundaries, pretty, pretty hard silo barriers right now across those boundaries and to conceive and create multi-agency programs and private pub public partnerships. What would be the challenges that would be picked out? And the committee chose four that sort of previewed for you, public health and biomedical research, environment and climate change, 
energy production and utilization and storage, agriculture, food, and water. These are huge mammoth issues, each of them. Um, but the challenges are existential in the sense that we're up against um, uh, uh, problems that right now we don't have ways to solve at the pace that they need to be solved. That's what makes them existential. And, and, um, uh, and so uh, the government needs to create a focus that will allow us to use the ingenuity and creativity and, and resources and people power that we have in this country to be able to take on um, uh, such challenges. One can we, we've heard in this meeting, in this forum, uh, the urgency of a of need for public health. Could we pr create um, a public health preparedness and emergency response fund, for example, that would bring together the resources and talents within the HHS, the CDC, BARDA, FDA, and the NIH to be able to really be prepared in for future pandemics and future other future health crises that may uh, visit us. So each of those challenges, I think, em embodies um, uh, complexities of that kind of magnitude, but also um, the, the importance and promise for, for carrying them forward. So what are, so if, if we're going to take those on, how do we do it? What's the, what are the enabling mechanisms? Where does the money go to be able to address those challenges in a coherent, coordinated way? So that brings us to the third recommendation, and that is to invest in four um, en enabling mechanisms, we call them, uh, in support of U.S. infrastructure on the one hand and the U.S. people using the, the tremendous resources that we have in the, the people of this country to be able to move forward. So, so wh where would those investments go? And you can see that uh, we lay out four such enabling mechanisms, research, um, uh, uh, computing, uh, technology and manufacturing, education, and human capital. So one can imagine on the research side that we, we really need to have a, a step function increase in research and there, therefore research funding to accelerate discovery of new knowledge about ourselves, that's biological as well as social and behavioral, and the physical and natural world around us, in turn enabling transformational advances in addressing societal challenges. Um, so on the research side, similarly, you could imagine uh, supporting new um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and quantum computing algorithms and tools that will integrate research findings across these many dis scientific disciplines and feed forward to increase the pace and impact of discovery. So a cycle of research that would be driven um, um, by those new modalities. On the computing side, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the committee imagines providing universal high performance broadband access as a public utility uh, and to expand lifeline programs to make internet affordable, you know, affordable meaning on the order of $10 per month for low-income residents. Um, we can imagine on the computing side creating uh, graph-based knowledge networks that would aggregate databases across diverse data types across many disciplines to drive transdisciplinary approaches uh, on to those four uh, challenge areas. Um, in in, in, in uh, health and medicine, for example, where uh, an area that I'm familiar with, one can imagine a net, such a network that would integrate genomic data, electronic health records, social and behavioral determinants of health, and environmental exposures uh, that could uncover disease mechanisms mm -hmm. and enable prediction and prevention, suggest approaches to therapy, and tell us how, why it is that individuals who have the same disease react to it differently, have a different progression, have a different response to therapies and so forth, moving toward precision medicine. On the technology manufacturing side, um, uh, uh, the it group imagines creating a dozen or maybe more geographically distributed technology hubs around, spread around the country, not just sit on the coasts, um, sites that will uh, confront major technology challenges at Manhattan project-like scope and scale creating critical platform technologies to enable research advances and motivating formation of new communities of, 
uh, academic and private sector development that would surround these new technology hubs, um, uh, manufacturing partners and so forth uh, that could be created around the country, uh, employ people in those areas and really exploit the human, the tremendous human capital that we have spread uh, throughout the nation. On the education and human capital side, uh, the, the committee imagines providing every student with a laptop computer, with internet and national research cloud access and basic programming skills. It will be those skills that will be necessary for people to move forward in society. And a part of some of the problems that we have and dispar the disparity problems that we have are that not, there's not full access to those technologies and tools. Um, support development and impl implementation of 100 pre-baccalaureate programs modeled after the University of Maryland Baltimore County's famous Meyerhoff Scholars Program, which is designed and has proven successful since 1989 to increase diversity in the STEM fields. Uh, imagine expanding several fold the availability of STEM graduate fellowships and training grants. Uh, drop the citizenship and permanent resident eligibility requirement to take advantage of the tremendous uh, talent pool that uh, uh, visits our country. Uh, and, and develop and implement 100 programs modeled after the Meyerhoff Graduate Fellows Program. Um, uh, and then uh, finally to develop uh, extensive, uh, broadly accessible retrain, uh, re uh, educational retraining programs that enable qualification for STEM, STEM related and STEM derivative employment. Big things, those are just a few examples of some big things that one can imagine these investments moving into and toward. So what if it worked? What if the recommendations were adopted? Uh, uh, the committee thinks that if that were the case, we would see STEM tools and approaches that would ameliorate four urgent existential, societal, and security challenges. Uh, that there would be a, a social and geographic disparities would be, would be um, uh, reduced. Uh, uh, disparities in education and expertise, in wealth, um, uh, access to those new jobs, access to clean energy and environment, and distribution of resources. Those disparities could be reduced by these uh, recommendations. And finally, U.S. competitiveness and preeminence in STEM would be affirmed. And, and that's not only for bragging rights. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's clear that the leader in these areas is going, going to be the, the voice that is able to articulate values and standards by which the, this new knowledge is used, these new technologies are used. So knowledge and technology are, are, are valueless, right? They, they're not intrinsically good or bad. It's how they are used and how they are deployed, how they are made accessible to all. And if U.S. is in the lead in this area, the U.S. will better be in a position to be able to have a major voice on how those values and standards are enunciated. So those are the recommendations. And let me stop there and hand it back to Mary. Keith, thank you so much. That was not only comprehensive, but just like you, very clear and gives us a lot to think about. So, you know, one question that I'm sure everybody has in mind is, is the American public ready for all this? You know, and are our decision makers ready? Well, I'm going to talk now um, about public opinion. And I'm going to do that with a very fast uh, look at some data that we commissioned in a public opinion survey. I, by we, I mean the, the committee. And I'm going to run through it pretty quickly with the help of Terry Schwarzbach from my team. Um, I want you to know that this is just a snapshot of top highlights. There's a lot more we can learn from this survey, and I um, hope that you will stay tuned in the weeks ahead as we release more of the data. It's uh, very new, hasn't been published, and um, we look forward to your thoughts about what it all means. Now, the reason that we did this is to keep a finger on the public pulse. Uh, because as you see here um, in the words of President Lincoln, public sentiment is, well, everything. Without public sentiment, nothing can fail. Um, 
with public sentiment, excuse me, nothing can fail and we have it now. So let's take a look at the data, starting with um, the methodology. So you can see here that this was a comprehensive online survey um, that had oversampling of ethnic minority groups that we wanted to make sure we were capturing as we considered uh, what people have to say right now. Um, we also, I'll show you, I've showed you here the sample sizes for other subgroups, which turn out to be quite significant. So the next slide shows us that three quarters of Americans agree that science benefits all or most Americans. Now, the first thing I'd like to say about this, which is, I think, entirely consistent with what you've been hearing, is we should be able to get to the place where all Americans say that science benefits all Americans, right? So you see here some breakdowns of um, political parties. And since we are in the run up to an election, we're gonna show a lot of that breakdown. And you can see some differences um, among them with always, always independents being less likely to give what we consider to be positive responses um, they do tend to be more libertarians, for one thing, and to be um, opposed to a lot of things that the government ultimately is responsible for. You can also see on this slide um, two other trends that you'll see throughout in that Hispanics in general are more likely to be positive, if you will, and young people are less likely to be so. So let's go to the next slide. Um, here you see that um, a strong majority, if you add um, a great extent and somewhat, believe that scientists, scientists benefits themselves. The work that scientists do benefits you. This is another thing that's so important that we'd like to get to a much higher level of support. But it's worth noting that it's not really bad right now. Next slide. Three quarters of Americans believe that they have benefited from vaccines. Again, we would like to think that would be 100% who would say so. Um, but uh, we know we've got a problem with vaccine hesitancy in this nation. It's been covered previously in our forum. And I will say that we've got more data in this survey to address that point. But I just wanted to bring it up while we were talking about benefits. Next slide. Now we go to the point of urgency. And that's been touched on by my colleagues, by Keith and Sudip, and you'll hear it again. So here we are testing a statement, one statement against another, and one calls, uh, makes, makes the, the uh, claim that the pandemic is a disruptive event and requires urgent re refocusing. Alternatively, there's a choice that says that things are going to get back to normal soon and we don't need increased efforts. We can see really four out of five Americans agree it's time for an urgent refocus. So let's go deeper on that. Next slide. We asked about 20 priorities, things that people might indicate were urgent or high or not so high, just neutral or low. You can see here and this, I underscore urgent because urgent is the way people are feeling right now. They want answers and they believe that science can help get us there. In fact, that science can help a lot. So you see here the top six responses and there's very tight grouping even after the six. Um, we're, we're not gonna go through all of the priorities, but you can see how they rank just for openers, things that are literally life and death ending COVID, finding new ways of preventing, tre treating, and curing other diseases, um, assuring a safe water supply, improving the public health system, assuring food supply, and reducing crime and violence. Next slide. When you combine urgent and high priorities, the rankings change a little bit, and you see now that driving economic growth and creating jobs has moved into the top six. Um, followed closely, I might add, by reducing crime and violence, which only dropped a little. But again, very, very strong support. This is like a mandate, is a mandate, to uh, those running for office to take bold action. Next slide. 
we've talked sometimes about who's going to pay for all this. Well, one option for paying for it, of course, is taxes, public support. And you can see here a breakdown of those who would say they would support either strongly or somewhat um, paying a dollar more per week in taxes for more scientific research. Just so you can understand the math, if that were put in place, it would uh, um, accrue to about $7.4 billion. And of course, if it's more than $1 per week, it would be more. Next slide. Now we're going to go to some global issues. First of all, nine out of 10 Americans agree that the US should be a global leader in scientific research. Nine out of 10. There isn't any doubt about this one. Um, the next slide. We asked a lot of questions about what are you concerned about? And here are three things that um, apply to some global issues. One of them um, points out that people are quite concerned that the U.S. is slipping in terms of our percentage of global R&D. People are also very concerned um, about CO2 levels and about the U.S. having among the highest numbers of hospitalizations from preventable causes and avoidable deaths. The next slide. Speaking of climate change, we, along with a lot of others, have commissioned surveys about climate change recently, and especially with the health um, uh, aspects taken into regard. But as we know also, as I say, from other surveys, there's a steady increase across a lot of demographics factors in those saying that climate change is harming us. You can see some of the breakdowns here just from our own data that was commissioned uh, in January of this year, already an increase of 10% of those expressing concern. Next slide. In addition, people are quite concerned, um, again, across political parties, across many social demographic categories. Um, they're concerned that climate change will cause harm over the next 10 years. Um, again, this is really a strong statement and it's backed up by many other um, polls over recent months, um, even of this year. The next slide. Now, we've we, it was mentioned earlier that we need changes in the public health system. We need them urgently. This is another um, choice where people are asked to agree with one statement or the other, and three quarters of Americans agree that COVID-19 reveals the need for major changes in the public health system and look at this among um, political parties too. This is another mandate. Next slide, please. Expanding on that, Americans say it's time to do more to prepare for future catastrophes. There's four, um, suggestions given here. These are things that we discussed um, in our committee. How about creating a national cloud for a, com a national cloud of computing reserve to assure that we have adequate computing power going forward? Very strong support. How about federally supported scholarships? Very strong support. Um, how about setting up a ready reserve of scientists to be called in to respond, somewhat like military reserves when we have a pandemic-like catastrophe? Yes, very strong support. And creating an international body that can help us respond to future disruptive events. Again, very, very strong support. Next slide. And again, people say they are willing to help pay for this. They'll pay specifically in this case a dollar more per week in taxes to support an emergency public health fund. And especially important here is the combination of strongly support and somewhat support, a very strong indication at 71% combined um, that this is a popular idea. Next slide. Now we've talked a little bit about the importance of of um, increasing our, a little bit, actually we've talked a lot of it about increasing our 
R&D spend, and it's phrased in this question about a percentage of GDP, making comparisons to other countries that have already achieved the goal of spending three to 5% of GDP on R&D. And you can see again here that there's good, solid support. Next slide. It's important to emphasize that our recommendations and the American public's expectations are not only about what government do, or for that matter, state governments. It's very important for public-private partnerships to thrive. And this is just one indicator from the survey and other me measures that people understand that the federal support is very important to private sector innovation, which they also want to thrive. Next slide. There's also good solid support for federally funded research in universities. Um, sometimes it's uh, been commented that people don't really know very much. We've seen it in our own um, commission surveys, really don't appreciate, know that um, universities are doing um, especially basic scientific research, um, but they are, and it's critical to our prosperity, our health, and our security in this nation. So people are, again, supportive. Similarly, next slide, they believe it's important for their own state to support university-based scientific research. And that's threatened right now um, because of the pandemic, but people understand that it's important. Thank you. Next slide. Keith talked a little bit about um, the importance of broadband access across the nation. And you can see here, this is one of those questions about um, level of concern, that people are concerned that children don't have what they need to learn right now. And again, this is very strong across uh, political party identification. Um, and we, it's one of our recommendations, as you heard, um, that we address this. Moving forward and speak, continuing with education, and the next slide, um, here we're showing a lot of data um, just to make the point that actually throughout this survey, um, racial and ethnic groups, for the most part, aligned with Americans overall, and they're, I should say, they're part of Americans overall. We just oversampled those groups to be sure we were catching um, any uh, significant differences. And you can see other trends that are um, consistent with uh, the survey throughout. You can also see to the right that there's been an increase since 2017 in the percentage of Americans saying they strongly agree that the federal government should assign a higher priority to improving what we call STEM education. Um, and also a decrease in those who aren't sure. People have made up their minds here and it's a mandate. Next slide. People also support in very high levels, um, special incentive payments, those might be fellowships, um, to enter STEM fields. And the next slide, you can see that people as individuals overwhelmingly say, this is overwhelming, um, that they would recommend to a young person, perhaps their own child, that they should enter the STEM fields. That's a real statement about the association Americans make with science in a very optimistic, enthusiastic, and positive way. So in my last slide, I'll just show you that um, we tested the uh, concept that it might be time to commit to a major new initiative to assure the health, security, and prosperity of the nation. And you can see, especially important to add, strongly agree and somewhat agree that three quarters of the public say, yes, this is the time. Again, it's enthusiasm, it's not just agreement, it's a sense of urgency and priorities. And these are the things that we believe will take the kinds of recommendations we've fashioned to date and those that might be forthcoming as we get your input in addition. And may, it will, these will cross the finish line if we all get behind them. The American public already is. 
Thank you, Terry, for the slides. So, um, where am I? Um, I'm back. Um, there's a lot of data-rich information, so I wanted to be sure to be able to uh, get it all in. So now um, I'm going to ask Ron Daniels, the, one of the co-chairs of the work that you've just been, heard reported out, to make a few comments on what you're thinking about all of this. Over to you, Ron. Uh, thanks, Mary, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate in this very important forum. Uh, I think my uh, uh, colleagues have really covered the waterfront in terms of the things that we've been working on with the committee over the last couple of months. But I would just say a few things because one of the things that I've been focused on is trying to think about how you deploy a strategy once we have a document with what we hope are a compelling set of priorities, recommendations that we'll take into the public sphere. How do we actually go about seeing that um, these commitments, particularly given the breadth and scale of what you've heard, are actually adopted, supported, enacted? And, um, and you know, even in the face of the very significant and compelling circumstances, which Sudi uh, uh, detailed at the outset of this uh, panel in terms of the, we've referred to it as the burning platform that really makes the investment in science compelling in this moment in time, uh, despite I think the cogency of the recommendations that Keith took you through, um, and uh, despite the you know very powerful uh, findings that Mary has shared in terms of what we've learned about where public sentiment is, when you really stop to get people to reflect on and think about the importance of science, despite all of that, we know that as as you all know in terms of. Uh, your advocacy work around uh, around science and scientific research, we know that we're going to face a very challenging uh, political environment for these ideas. Uh, so despite the fact that there's a lot of normative force uh, and even demonstrated public sentiment in support of these ideas, we know that we enter into an environment um, whichever um, party um, holds uh, 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 power after uh, November, where uh, the deficit and debt at some point are going to attract uh, attention um, in terms of uh, what kind of fiscal capacity we have to make for investments. We know that there are going to be a number of other competing claims, straight out uh, uh, demands for a greater investment in healthcare or in education or in infrastructure. Um, you know, perhaps uh, despite the uh, spending on defense over the last several years, that there'll be still a sense that, particularly with an ascendant uh, China, that there is need for further investment there. Uh, so we, we know, we're not naive in believing that we're going to enter into an environment where, despite all the energy and the force around this, that this is going to be a cakewalk. And so, you know, what I'm uh, spending time on um, and thinking about with a, um, a subgroup of members of this uh, committee is how do you ensure that what is compelling on paper actually cuts through the legislative process and ultimately is endorsed? Um, and here, you know, I think that um, what we're hoping at least is of course that we capture the moment as Mary often says, let's meet the moment so that we hope that we're meeting the moment in terms of really playing to the growing anxiety about where we are as a society and hopefully allaying people's concerns about, um, uh, about how science um, can uh, meet a lot of the things that people are concerned about, whether it's, it's around the climate or it's public health issues or it's uh, national security and so forth, that science is an answer, but then um, imagining that even in terms of other dimensions of this moment, particularly around the sense of concern around racial justice and the reckoning around issues of, of, of equity and, um, and the, uh, ensuring the promise of American society is delivered uh, to all uh, who are uh, meritorious. Um, I think it's, it's, it's our hope that if we put these things together and this sort of sense of that uh, investments in science, science 
have really been such an important bounty for the country um, and, and have the promise of continuing to be that for the country, but at the same time that we could all benefit in very significant and important ways from that investment. More than that, that if we do our job well, and if we meet this moment, again, Mary's term, that we can find a way to ensure that everyone who has demonstrated interest and capability in science um, can be part of the system. And so again, uh, to the extent that there has long been, as Sudeep uh, referred to early, earlier, you know, concerns about uh, the morality and, um, and um, the um, uh, justifiability of, um, of why some people are, end up as being, uh, as being productive and effective in the science research system and others don't, to the extent that those issues now are joined with this really compelling sense that we've got a moment now in, um, in this country where we're facing really serious challenges and in particular serious international rivalry that calls upon us to find ways of bringing more people into the science system. And so what was before an imperative that sounded in equity now becomes an imperative that is sounded um, in terms of our basic prosperity um, as a country and uh, the sustainability of the promise of this country that really requires that we get the very best people to uh, participate in STEM and to find clear and easy pathways uh, for, uh, for students from uh, all over the country, uh, whether uh, as a member of traditionally underrepresented minorities or in um, geographically um, un underrepresented communities in terms of the science system or um, in, in, in terms of uh, thinking about uh, uh, people who um, have, um, uh, who have um, been unable to participate because of uh, disability, all these looking at a number of different barriers that in, fact, that in the past have impeded access and now seen that if that we need all these folks to be all in for us uh, to be able to really uh, muster a response to this moment that is commensurate with the challenges of this moment. So our hope is that you know that 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 what's on paper really resonates with the public, but more than that, that we can imagine um, enlisting more support from. Uh, stakeholders that um, may and be in the past have stood on the sidelines uh, during these kind of debates, but we'll see in fact that um, given the very um, uh, broad and capacious understanding that we have of what, of what science is about in this country, that they will see that they have, a, they have an interest in being aligned with uh, this, uh, this campaign for significant incremental investment in science. Thank you, Ron. Um, I think you hit the high, high points and made it clear that we're not finished here. <laughs> Our job isn't done. Um, we have um, miles to go. So we're going to take questions now. And um, I understand that we do have some. I'm going to ask Caitlin um, to help us with that. Uh, you can, if you wish, you know, enter your questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll say in the interest of time and to assure that we hear from as many of you as possible uh, that before I ask my colleagues to respond, we may hear a few questions in a row just to get us going. I also add that if we don't get to your question or you would prefer to engage us uh, via email or telephone, please don't hesitate. It's important. So if we could get everybody um, back up. Caitlin, there you are. Um, Yes, great. Um, um, thank you for the presentation. And I know we've been receiving a lot of questions about when the slides will be available. So I know the data is a burning question amongst everyone and uh, eager, to, eager to dig in. Um, our, and I'll kind of try to ask a couple of survey questions first and um, kind of group those together. First one was just a, a question about um, the question that you asked uh, the public about increasing GDP. Um, is this also put in the context of what we would spend less on? 
I'll do that one quickly. No, it wasn't, and that was on purpose uh, because the whole concept, if you go back, say, to uh, Vannevar Bush, is that we invest in ourselves as a nation, in, we invest in R&D, in STEM, and we grow the economy. And that's, of course, what the Chinese are doing right now and other nations. So there was definitely not a trade-off involved. Um, another question was um, on one of the slides, it showed there was a 10 point gap between Democrats and Republicans in terms of those who believe everyone in the US benefits from science. What are your thoughts on why fewer Republicans perceive science as benefiting everyone? You know, that's a, a tough one, and my colleagues may have a um, point of view on that. Uh, we'd just be speculating to say here, you know, this one of the things about um, public opinion surveys is you get a one-shot snapshot on them. And if you want to dive deeper, you need to do focus groups, you know. And um, it's, uh, you know, I just, I'd rather not just speculate, but if anybody else would like to chime in, maybe suit up from your time on Capitol Hill, you have a thought? And it would be complete speculation. I wish I, <laughs> I, wish I knew. <laughs> okay. Okay. We can go to another question um, as well. Another, uh, and this had been talked about um, in the slide presentations as well. Uh, your survey says something like nine out of 10 Americans think global leadership in science is important, um, but isn't China outpacing us? What's the disconnect between public opinion and what's actually happening um, with respect to China? Well, I, I want to pass that on to a, a colleague. The data, the survey is what it is, but that there's a bigger question. So, they, so uh, I'll say that they haven't passed us yet. They're projected to pass us in 2030, which is not too far off. Um, uh, uh, but what's clear is that they are very aggressive in, in uh, crafting their year over year increases for research and development. That's why they're going to pass us, of course. Um, and and um, uh, so there's just lots of activity, lots of dedication on the part of the government that seems to recognize that advances in science and technology um, uh, are you know, the ticket to being the leading uh, society in the world. Um, and and um, uh, so I think this is something that they recognize and something that we that the recommendations of this committee uh, are attempting to help other people appreciate and and really craft a way to move forward that will keep us in the lead. Thank you. Anybody? Um, I'll move on to, oh, sorry, Mary, please. Oh, go ahead, Caitlin. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and move into another kind of grouping of questions about um, federal investment in R&D. So, there was one question about how would a bigger investment in federal R&D be, be distributed across the science disciplines? And then a related question was, um, how do you decide how much should be invested in basic research versus translation, translational research? Keith, you want to take that to start? Yeah, um, uh, sure. So, so um, uh, the, the way that the budget, the federal budget is, is uh, generally uh, crafted is that the various agencies that are uh, engaged in scientific, science and technology research uh, are, are literally asked by the appropriations committees what their needs are um, and where how much of a budget change increase, of course, uh, uh, would enable them to be able to move, to be able to advance. Um, uh, it's, it's not, it's actually not common that those that those aspirations are actually met uh, with uh, with dollars, uh, but uh, that's how the the, the, the uh, budget moves forward. So uh, that will continue. But what we're what the committee is trying to do is to be, be able to set a new uh, level to be able to craft uh, to be able to enunciate aspirations that will be able to move us forward in these uh, particular societal challenge areas. And um, by doing so, um, uh, help Congress to appreciate that this is going to be a costly endeavor, but worthwhile. Uh, and so it's worth putting in a, a large amount of additional money. Um, in terms of then uh, uh, um, being able to see cooperation across those silo ba bar barriers that I was talking about, 
Uh, that's the that's the really what the committee imagines would be the job of this new council, the National STEM Council, that would look across the uh, these uh, big challenge areas, say that it is essential that the U.S. use its science and technology uh, expertise and resources and people um, to be able to put focus on these these areas. And so we'll look then across the different agencies and look at ways that they can cooperate um, and, and also to move into public-private partnerships with, with the private sector uh, to be able to advance on them. And that's the task of that job and, and of that new council. And, and it's distinctive because um, uh, we haven't had that sort of coordination uh, power before to focus on particular issues. So that's the hope of the committee that such a council would uh, actually have that effect. Okay, anybody else? Uh, another question, Mary, Mary, can I just, uh, I think it's important just to underscore the importance about uh, investment in basic uh, research though. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I like to do in thinking about any public policy problem is to ask the question of why is government in this role in the first place? You know, why don't we just rely, for instance, on the private sector to fund research? What is the argument for investment in research in the first place? And there's a very good in economic or uh, political science parlance. We talk a lot about uh, market failures. We talk about public goods and so forth. But rationales that say that for things like quintessentially basic research, where the benefits uh, are broadly distributed um, and that the it's hard for people to capture uh, those benefits on their own, that that requires um, government investment to make up for the shortfall that would happen were the government not to invest. It's an, odd, it's a, it's an old uh, and important concept, but it's one that's worth remembering because, you know, in this moment, what's been really striking over the last several uh, years is that the uh, industrial investment in research has actually increased as a percentage of GDP while the federal government's percentage has backed up. And what that at least implies for me is that um, you're losing the basic research function, which will inform, enrich, enhance the quality of the applied research that is being done in the country. And so there's a, there is a deep dependence on that um, forthright a uh, very vigorous role by the federal government in supporting basic research that in truth, if it doesn't do it, there's really few other contenders, um, foundations, other actors, universities certainly, that can make up for the difference. So however we end up in, um, in thinking about the optimal level of uh, science funding in this country and what are the key priorities that are funded under it, uh, it is important that we really do underscore the, um, the central importance of these investments in basic science, because if the government doesn't do it, no one's going to do it to the same scale, and that will impoverish the whole system. So this has to be, it's, it's not just about more money. It's got to be more money that's directed to activities and things that would not happen, but for the intervention of the federal government. Yeah, Ron, I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm sorry that I forgot that part of the question. And, and I'll, I'll, let me just add to what, what you said, that, that, that Vannevar Bush was in, incredibly visionary in 1945 in really saying um, uh, very clearly, very, very explicitly, what Ron just said, and that is that the, the federal government must support basic investigation, basic research, because the private sector can't do it. Their economic model doesn't permit them to operate on the, to operate in these long term large scale uh, uh, endeavors for simple discovery of information uh, rather than making a product that that then can sell and enrich their their uh, stockholders and help the uh, help people um, and so it really is the federal government is alone that's able to do this it's not alone anymore because of uh, philanthropy and so forth that, that Ron mentioned but by far the majority of the funding really goes that way. To put a specific um, uh, agency on the spot here, um, uh, it's something that I know a fair amount about the NIH. Um, and and um, uh, when uh, Elias Terhouni was the director, he really made the point that he felt that there had to be a pyramid 
of 60% expenditure for basic, basic research um, uh, and 25% uh, uh, for translational research that bridges the basic discoveries to things that can be applied. And then 15% for um, uh, clinical research uh, involving patients. And, and he um, uh, tried to maintain that pyramid. Uh, we've slipped a bit from that. And I think it really underscores Ron's point that uh, we really, uh, really want to be attentive to the fact that maintaining that primacy of the basic research uh, uh, endeavor is really important. Sudip looks like you're ready to say something. You know, I would just give one very clear example of how money makes a difference. Um, so in this crisis on COVID, uh, we, you know, for the past, we've been very fortunate through the work of Research America and others, we have invested uh, in NIH. And the structural biology of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 was accomplished in weeks, weeks. We went from isolation of the virus to the structure of the outer protein in weeks. Incredible, extraordinary. Um, at the same time, we did not invest over the last few years in public health. And we've seen that infrastructure not be there when we needed it, contact tracing, et cetera, uh, across the nation. We haven't seen that. So money makes a difference. This is not esoteric. This is not about um, uh, you know, the, the fact that ugh, you know, we need more research. Money makes a difference in lives and in uh, quality of life. Thanks, Sudip, and all three of you. Uh, Caitlin, do we have more questions? Yes, we do. And actually one that came in that I think is really along the same lines in terms of how we should consider how we spend money as much as we consider how much money we spend. So thinking about the right mix of incentive and institutions beyond just raw dollar amounts. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to provide a comment on that or. You know, that was certainly discussed uh, by our committee and which includes, as you know, um, from the slide, perhaps recall, two former members of Congress, Bart Gordon and um, Charlie. Charlie, oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. And, and we know anyway that members of Congress rightly representing the public ask about, are we spending the money that taxpayers have agreed to have spent on science? Are we spending it well? This is an appropriate question, and it goes to the point, uh, Keith, you were making about a coordinating function. That right. includes being sure we're spending money well. But you all might want to um, expand on that. No, Important. Uh, you know, what I, I, I would just mention uh, some of that, and I, I think I'm stealing Ron's, uh, Ron's ideas here, but uh, the, the challenges are going to continue to come. Uh, and we need to be able to respond to innovate uh, in the face of what, what I haven't even thought of yet uh, 10 years from now. And having a coordinating function like, uh, like Keith talked about uh, gives us the apparatus uh, to be looking out on the horizon and saying, well, what is coming? What is coming in terms of an economic challenge? What is coming in terms of a public health challenge? What is coming in terms of a, uh, a national security challenge uh, from technology? Uh, and being able to look over that horizon and feeding down uh, not completely. You know, we still want the bottoms up, but we need a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that coordination as well. And uh, and that's that's really what some of the recommendations are for. You know, just on on the on that point, Sudip, one of the things that I think has been really interesting has uh, been the discussion that we've been having uh, within the committee around the whole issue of how do you support moonshots. And you know, one uh, within the committee, there's a sense if we look back to Sputnik, this was really a galvanizing moment in the country in the extent to which we were able to do the unimaginable in a record period of time, and then, and trying to imagine, you know, what are the moonshots or what is the moonshot that we should be uh, focusing upon now? And I think you know what there's really a strong shared sense of is that it's, uh, that's just too simple a way of conceiving the world. That, that is that we're in a world now where just the pace of technological innovation is, um, is accelerating and, um, and there's so many different issues that we have to grapple with that the idea that we could just pause and say, okay, the 10 next years, we're just gonna focus on this um, is incredibly naive. And so what we've got to develop in the, in, in, um, in the, in the country at a 
level that is uh, much greater than at present is the capacity for multiple mini moonshots. There's just got to be the sense of we're in a world of continuous innovation and that um, we can't imagine that this is episodic, that we, we work really actively and then we pause and go through a refractory period and then sort of crank up again when we think about the next big thing. We're in a world of a lot of next big things that have to be done simultaneously. And again, to go back Sudi, to what you said, in terms of the challenges that are before us, it's, it's hard to imagine that we could just think about public health and just say, well, we're gonna take a pause while California is burning on the, you know, on the climate side, or you know, we're gonna just have to you know, rest a bit on um, the power of the genomics revolution and precision medicine while we sort, you know, we sort out this issue. That's, that's not the world we're in. And so what we've really got to do is figure out a way in which not just by the quantum of investment, but by the capacity to spend it smartly um, on a number of different really transformative projects simultaneously um, is, 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 is how, how we have to be able to uh, end up in this uh, particular time. Yeah. So, Caitlin, do we, have, do we have time for, oh, Sudip, go ahead. I just want to add one quick thing to that, which is that you know, the scale of the problems that Ron's talking about are gigantic, right? We've seen the trillions of dollars that COVID has cost us. Uh, we know that when you, uh, when you innovate, you add trillions of dollars to our GDP. So you get this, you get two, two, you get a two for here. You get the growth in the economy, which is trillions of dollars, and you are preventing things that are going to cost you trillions of dollars. And so you have this, you know, the scale of the investment needs to match the scale of the risk. The scale of the investment needs to match the scale of the, uh, of the potential growth. And, and that's really what the committee, I think, is arguing in terms of these bold numbers. Yeah. Great. So, Caitlin, do we have time for one more question, maybe? Yeah, I think um, this might be a, a good one to close out my, my segment on. Um, but curious um, about each panelist's thoughts um, or what they perceive as the greatest opportunity our nation can seize if we invest more. Okay, so panelists, we're running out of time. So you've got 30 seconds each to answer that. Um, Keith, you want to start? Sure. Um, uh, so I think that the committee was wise in identifying the set of challenges that they want to take on and then aligning with what Ron was talking about. If you think about those challenges in, in, in um, uh, public health in, environment and climate in energy and then agriculture, food and water, you realize that not only are there huge challenges there, but they're that they need to be integrated. We can't solve the, we can't grow all the food in the Midwest of the United States and then use petroleum to ship it around the world. That will destroy the environment and so forth. Each of them is a huge challenge, but they have to be taken on um, uh, in parallel and in, in an integrated fashion. So that's the reason for the big investment, but the payoff, uh, uh, w without that big investment, we won't get a payoff. So we have to take them all on at the same time. Suda. You know, I'll, I'll be really parochial. I'll say that, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I hope that there is a cure for Alzheimer's uh, in the next few years. And I want that cure wherever in the world that it's invented. If it's invented in China or it's invented in Germany, I will want to make use of it. But I want to invent it here because I want the economic impact and the health impact that comes from that. Uh, and this type of investment is what's going to make that uh, possible in a competitive world. Ron, your thoughts? So I echo uh, on the outputs here, um, all, all the things that uh, Keith and Sudip have said. But I, I, I do think that, again, I want to sort of go back to, uh, Mary, your turn, meeting the moment. I actually think that it's inconceivable to me that we're going to be able to make real traction on a lot of these challenges if we don't solve something that I think is actually easily soluble and is a longstanding challenge. And that is the, you know, the traditional marginalization of just too many parts of the country from this enterprise. We need the best brains that we can get to be part of this. And I'm convinced that whether you're looking at barriers that are geographic in character or whether they are barriers that are economic, that is to say lower socioeconomic uh, students who don't, get, uh, who don't get to participate in STEM education, uh, racial minorities, women, it's just like we have seen this for decades that we have not been able to bring these folks into the system. And I think we're really at this point, particularly given the demographic advantages 
that rivals like China and India have in terms of having you know, several, uh, several times larger populations than us, we just can't allow any of our fellow citizens not to be, who have capability not to be part of this. So I, I think that's, that's something that, again, in this moment is really compelling to me and a, and a top priority. Well, I, I know we all agree with that, and so does everybody on our committee. So with that last word, shall we say, um, I thank you, Suda, Keith, and Ron, and all the members of our working group, and special thanks to our staff director, Max Bronstein, and all the staff who contributed. Thank you also to the Kavli Foundation and Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies, we pledge to you all to continue to raise, do what we possibly can, everything we possibly can, to raise the sights of Americans and their decision makers in the service of a science strong, science bold nation so that we can achieve better health, prosperity, and security for all. I want to thank, to now moving to the overall program, and we're at the end of three days. I want to thank the more than 90 speakers and participants who we have had with us over the last three days. And I want to thank the Research America Board of Directors for their support and participation. Continued gratitude also to the members of our, of our alliance. They're really our source of inspiration and backbone. And I want to thank the Research America staff for their hard work, long hours, and their creativity in bringing this forum to life for all the hundreds of those who have tuned in. Now, I also want to thank our event sponsors, starting with a big thank you to Pfizer as our lead sponsor. And thank you to our panel sponsors, AbvaMed, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Elsevier, GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson, Pharma, Regeneron, Sanofi, and UCB. Thank you to our fireside chat sponsors, Bio and Picori, our advocacy and action sponsor, Eli Lilly and Company, our Flash Talks competition sponsors, ASI, and our 20 Voices, 3 Minutes, 1 Question sponsors, the American Society for Microbiology, the Association of Clinical Research Organizations, Amgen, Colgate, and the Medical Device Manufacturers Association. Thank you all for making this three-day event possible. Now, if you enjoyed the various sessions, this is a reminder that we host member-only programs for our Alliance, just like these, monthly, if not weekly. If you haven't had a moment to visit the booth to learn more about Research America, visit our Alliance page on our website anytime. The National Forum platform will stay live for a month so that you can rewatch and share these discussions. We will also post the videos on our website, that's researchamerica.org, and on our social media platforms. I look forward to being in touch. Meanwhile, stay safe, stay well, and keep leading. Have a great evening. Bye now. <laughs>